All right, this is concept three notes on system interactions. So just a little overview before we dive in. We talked about this previously in our cells unit, but organisms are made up of organ systems, which are made up of organs, which are made up of tissues, which are made up of cells. And cells are the most basic unit of life. A tissue is just a group of cells working together for a common function. An organ is just a group of tissues working together for a common function. And an organ system is a group of organs working together for a common function. And all of your organ systems work together to keep you, an organism, alive and functioning. Something we've talked about previously in concept one in terms of homeostasis is that a dynamic equilibrium is maintained from the system level. So at the organ system level, all the way down to the cellular level. So it is maintained in all these different aspects from large scale to small scale in order to maintain that equilibrium. Nothing inside of you works in isolation. Even the organ systems are all working together. The cells, they're working all together. And this is a really, really important idea to understand. So for this concept, I'm just going to do a very brief overview of the 11 main organ systems in humans specifically. This is not an anatomy course, so this is not going to have the depth that you would have in an anatomy course. But I do want to highlight some of the key organs, tissues, and cells in these organ systems and really focus on, okay, what is the function of this organ system overall? Because you're going to be doing a body system interactions project where you are going to work on teaching us about your body system, but also how your body system is, does not work in isolation. How is it working together with other organ systems in the body in order to maintain homeostasis? So this is just going to be a brief overview for everyone so you have a general idea of what each of the organ systems do. Also, I want to touch on an example of how a non-human organism utilizes these types of organ systems as well because I think it's really easy to just kind of get in our head and not realize that there are other living things that are really complex too and have these types of organ systems as well. One thing I want to mention too is you may have heard that there are 12 organ systems in humans and it kind of, different people say 11 or 12. The 12th is the lymphatic system, which I'm not really going to cover in detail and I'll explain why at the end of the notes. So first, let's talk about the circulatory system. Main function of the circulatory system, which is also sometimes referred to as the cardiovascular system. So those are referring to the same thing. But this system, its main purpose is gas exchange in your cells, as well as nutrient transport to and from cells throughout your body. And we're using the blood to really do that. So key structures, the organ is essentially your heart. That is a huge structure. Here's a diagram of your heart. Blood vessels, which are like your arteries, your capillaries, your veins. And of course, your blood is really important too. Common misconception, your blood is not blue versus red. Oftentimes, diagrams just show blue versus red to try to differentiate blood that is oxygenated versus blood that is not. But your blood is not blue. So don't believe that. Okay, I told you it was going to be brief. I do want to mention the non-human example. So here's this is kind of cool. Jellyfish and other more simple organisms, um, animals specifically, they don't need circulatory systems like ours. Instead, they transport their nutrients and remove waste and conduct gas exchange all via diffusion. So because their structure is a little bit simpler, you can see kind of a breakdown of their structure. They're able to just diffuse those things in and out um, a little bit easier, and they don't have to have as complex of a transport system like we do. All right, the respiratory system. This kind of goes hand in hand with the circulatory or cardiovascular system because they really work together because it too is involved in gas exchange, taking in oxygen and then getting rid of carbon dioxide, which is a product of cellular respiration. Key structures, your lungs, your nose, that nasal cavity, your mouth, your trachea, your diaphragm, which we see a picture of here. All of these play a big role in the respiratory system. Okay, so what does this look like different? Well, think about animals that live 
in the water. Aquatic animals like fish, they're going to use gills to take in dissolved oxygen in the water and release carbon dioxide. So those work, uh, their gills are much more than just slits or holes in the side of a fish's mouth. And if you want to learn more, you should totally research it because it's pretty fascinating. All right, let's talk about the digestive system. Main function is to break down food and absorption of nutrients for the body. Um, so key structures are going to be your mouth, where food comes in, your stomach, your intestines, but there's all these other factors as well too. So this is kind of cool. There are really four types of animal digestive systems we see in different animals, and one of them that cattle and deer have are called ruminant digestive systems. They have these really large stomachs that actually have four compartments. And what they do is they'll take in a ton of food because they can and they have the space for it and they don't really chew it well. So then they'll regurgitate it. They'll chew it up some more and then they'll swallow it, which is kind of gross. Um, the other types of digestive systems, there's monogastric, which is like us. It's just kind of one simple stomach. Um, pigs and dogs have that too. We mentioned ruminant. There's a pseudo-ruminant, which is similar in that there you eat a ton um, like ruminants, but there's not the four compartments in the stomach. So this is like horses and guinea pigs and rabbits. And then the avian digestive system, which is um, birds and poultry, I guess, if you will, they kind of have a, the most unique digestive system. So I won't get into all of theirs. Okay, so goes hand in hand. The digestive system is the excretory system. So it's not just getting rid of waste. So many people think excretory system is just urine and feces, and that's not true. Main function of this is water balance. Getting It is getting rid of waste, but in the sense of your sweat and your urine and filtering your blood. So key structures are your kidneys, your bladder, your lungs even, and your skin. These are all a part of the excretory system. So many people just think it has to do with peeing and pooping, and it's not at all. Um, and then the center picture here is a cross-section of a kidney, which is pretty cool. And this is showing the connection between kidneys and your bladder and where the urine would be released. And then this is a picture of lungs. So, non-human example of the excretory system, plants, they have to release waste too. Just because they don't pee and poop doesn't mean they don't have their own type of waste. So they have gaseous waste, they have carbon dioxide, they have excess, um, excess CO2, oxygen, excess water that they aren't using for photosynthesis. All of this is being released through their stomata in their leaves. So these are these pores, if you will, in their leaves. And this is also how they take in CO2 in order to do photosynthesis. So they'll get rid of excess CO2. They'll get rid of excess oxygen that they make from photosynthesis. And then they'll also get rid of excess water as well through a process called transpiration, which we talked about in our ecology unit when we learned about the water cycle. All right, the integumentary system. Main function acts as a barrier to protect the body from the outside world, as well as it regulates temperature and controls water loss. We'll talk about the integumentary system when we get into the immune system a little bit, and especially in our mini unit on pathogens, which is disease causing agents, because your skin is one of your greatest barriers in, in keeping you healthy and not sick. So key structures, Skin, hair, nails, and then associated glands like your sweat glands. Those are all part of the integumentary system. Non-human example. We may not have scales or slime like the snail does or hooves or feathers or true fur. All of these, though, make up other animals' integumentary systems. So it's a very diverse organ system. All right, the muscular system. Main function is movement and stabilization. Key structures are your skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscles. Fun fact, typically the strongest and largest muscle in most animals is actually in the jaw, and then the smallest is typically in your inner ear. So muscles are all over, and they range from really large or really long, um, like in some of your leg muscles, to super tiny, like in your ear. All right, a non-human example, this is pretty cool. The muscles in a bat's larynx 
are some of the quickest muscles that exist, and they have the ability to contract 200 times per second. I thought that was the coolest fact when I was learning more about the muscular system in order to teach this to you. Animals are amazing. Okay, skeletal system. Sometimes this gets grouped with the muscular system and they call it the musculoskeletal system just because they go hand in hand in aiding in movement, um, but support also. And then your skeletal system also protects some of your internal organs. Key structures would be your bones, of course, tendons, ligaments, and cartilage as well. So this is cool. Insects and crustaceans have exoskeletons. So ours is endo. It's inside of our body. Theirs is on the outside. They, starfish have skeletons made of tubes and fluids rather than bones, which I thought was pretty cool. So I think we associate a skeleton with bones, and that's not necessarily the case. So here's a picture of a starfish, and there's a little crustacean for you. All right, the nervous system incredibly fascinating. Its main function is collecting, processing, and responding to sensory information that your organs take in. Also, because of that, it's going to control your voluntary movements, which are the ones you're choosing to make, and your involuntary or your reflex actions. Key structures are your brain, your spinal cord, and then all the connected nerves and sensory organs that are all throughout your body. So this really interconnects with all of them. And then the key cells that you should know are neurons. Those are our brain cells. This is super fascinating to me. So in general, non-human animal brains are less complex than ours. However, dolphins have a more developed auditory region of the brain than we do, which is pretty cool. So their hearing ability is more advanced than ours, which I thought was really, really fascinating. Now, something that goes hand in hand with the nervous system is the endocrine system. So its main function is the production and secretion of hormones for regulation of the body. So your growth, your metabolism, sexual development. But if you remember from concept two, when we talked about signaling and communication, hormones are huge for signaling. But of course, so are neurotransmitters, which has to do with your nervous system. So these two really, really work together in order to um, allow for signaling and communication and thus maintaining homeostasis. Key structures would be your hypothalamus, which is a part of your brain, and then a bunch of really important glands like your pituitary gl gland, the adrenal gland, your thyroid, that kind of thing. So a non-human example. An amphibian's endocrine system is very similar to ours. We actually, fun fact, our endocrine glands are almost identical to that of cats and dogs. Um, and pretty much every animal that has a nervous system has an endocrine system too. So again, they go really hand in hand. But an amphibian's is also similar to ours, except for they have even more importance on their thyroid because this is what makes it possible for that maturation from a larva all the way to the adult form which is pretty cool and makes sense because we said the endocrine system is important in regulating development and growth. And that's obviously big development for a frog. All right, the reproductive system. So all animals need to be able to reproduce in order to have offspring. And so this system allows that to happen, aka we're making babies here. We're doing that by producing egg and sperm, releasing hormones that um, that signal for nurturing developing offspring, all of those kinds of things. Key structures differ in male um, animals versus female. In males, there are the testes and the penis. Um, this is a uh, cross-section of some of the, I guess cross-section is the best word, but a diagram of some of the important structures in a male. And the, the here is the testes organ, and here's the urethra that comes through the penis. But this is just kind of showing how they're all connected here. Um, and then in females, we have the vagina, the uterus, and the ovaries. Fallopian tubes are important too. That's what's happening here. But these are just a few of the really key structures. Now, this flushes out differently, though, in different animals, and kangaroos and other marsupials are fascinating to me, how unique their reproductive systems are. Um, so, a way that their reproductive system is different from ours, females actually have two vaginas that both open externally, but through the same hole, but they both would lead to different areas in the uterus, so they wouldn't just go to the same spot. Males 
then have a corresponding two-pronged penis for the two vaginas. Another unique feature, if that is not unique enough, is what we know kangaroos to have, which is this pouch. So when a baby is born, the fetus, which they call a joey, is really underdeveloped compared to like a human fetus. And so it instinctively crawls into the mother's pouch when it's born, and that's where it's going to continue to grow and develop until it's able to survive outside and away from the mother out of the pouch, which is truly fascinating to me. Okay, the last one I'm going to talk about is the immune system. And again, I'm not mentioning the lymphatic system, which people also make uh, or associate as the 12th organ system, simply because the immune and the lymphatic system share the same key structures and organs. But the lymphatic system is more connected to your circulatory system, whereas the immune system is more connected to your endocrine. So they have some different functions for sure, but structurally they're really similar. So your immune system's main goal is to defend, to deflect, and to destroy any infectious, infectious agents that make their way into the body. So key structures are your lymph nodes, which are important in the lymphatic system, your blood vessels, the thymus, bone marrow, and your spleen. And really, the immune system is the most fascinating to me because every single organ system has something to do with the immune system. And in our pathogens mini unit, we're going to talk about the immune system in major detail um, because it's, it's just super fascinating how your body is able to fight so many pathogens that you're exposed to on a daily basis. So last thing I want to mention, not human example. So Humans do have the most complex immune systems of all animals, but that doesn't mean that other animals don't have their own way of doing things. So immune cells are made in your bone marrow, which is found in your bones. Vertebrates, though, that do not have true bones, like sharks and stingrays, they wouldn't have bone marrow in their bones. So they actually make their immune cells in their spleen and kidneys, which is kind of interesting. So just showing another kind of interconnection between these body systems. So that's what I want you to take away from this. One, organisms are amazing. Their organ system and organization of their cells and how they all work together is absolutely amazing. But two, none of this works in isolation. All of these things are interconnected from a large-scale organ system level all the way down to the cellular level, and they're all essential in regulation and maintaining homeostasis.